Good evening. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Sari Kamen. I am the Public Programs Director of MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you this evening to oh, Caribbean Chinese Fried Rice. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, it is so wonderful to have you with us. Although I know there are many of you who have been coming to our Food for Thought program collaboration series with the Green Space Now. Some of you have probably been with us since September when we started. It's been many, many months and it is such uh, an honor to, to collaborate with the Green Space. They're a terrific partner. So as always, I really, really want to thank them. Um, for those of you who are tuning into a MOFAD program for the first time, like I said, we're the Museum of Food and Drink. We're based in New York City. We have been virtual on the internet since, well, oh, I don't know, a year or, or more at this point. Um, so I'm so thankful and appreciative of all of your support through this time coming to our virtual programs and making sure that at some point we will have a space and we will be able to welcome you there in person again. Um, that being said, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter if you have not yet. It is the best way to stay in touch with us, find out about all of our virtual programs, which are going to be continuing. Um, for the foreseeable future. We do have plans in the works to maybe start doing some in-person programs again at some point in the fall. So make sure you're signed up for the newsletter so you are the first to know, but we'll still do virtual programs because I know that our community has expanded well beyond New York City, which has truly been the, the most wonderful silver lining of uh, this pandemic year thus far. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful guests this evening. Some of you may recognize them from the program they did with us all the way back in August, which interrogated uh, the origins of the dish chop suey. So they're back together, reunited for fried rice. Uh, first, we have Chef Lucas Sin. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope every... I'm good, right? You're good. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> my name is Beth. Uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'm the chef of these two restaurants in New York and Connecticut called Jinza Kitchen and Nicely Chinese. But tonight, primarily, I am just somebody who is ridiculously interested in the confluence of Chinese cuisine and other cultures. I spend as much time as I can outside of running these two restaurants thinking about the relationship between Asian cooking, Chinese cooking, and the rest of the world. And there could be no better collaborator to think about this with me than Professor Kelly Goff, um, who will introduce herself next. Take it away, Tao. Great. It's lovely to be here yet again. Thank you, Sari, for such a warm welcome and the vision to bring Lucas and I together. I'm excited to cook. Um, about me, I am a professor, I'm a DJ. Um, I just learned to cook a year ago. And it's been an incredible journey through food towards Afro-Asian culture, histories that are near and dear to my heart, to my family story, which I'll talk about today, but also to my teaching um, and to the Afro-Asia group, um, which I run to examine how culture is a way that we can understand the intersection of African and Asian diaspora. So really looking forward to what we're gonna get into today with the fried rice. Thank you so much, Lucas and Professor Goff. I think you should just take it away from here. Enjoy the show, everyone, and see you soon. Great. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just excited that this is part two with you, Lucas. Um, we talked about the confluence of these diasporas and cuisines. We talked about the fact that we both traveled to Cuba. Mm -hmm. We've tasted fried rice across the world. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear about times that you've visited Cuba, Havana, um, your experience in the Caribbean with Chinese diaspora? Yeah, well, the thing with fried rice is, I don't know how many people here know me, um, but for whatever reason, I've been associated with this fried rice recipe called golden fried rice as of last year. Um, but that doesn't mean that I haven't been obsessed with fried rice my whole life. Fried rice is one of those things, and I've cooked in very, very many countries. I've cooked in, um, Cuba, I mean, in Japan, I've cooked it with um, the, many of my cooks at the restaurant were Dominican, I've cooked with Mexican, Mexican chefs, and it's almost like every culture that you cook Chinese food in, people will always talk about fried rice, and it always seems as if there is some variation on fried rice in a certain culture. What I'm excited about specifically with this cuisine that we might call very broadly Chino Latino is 
how the, the like little specific differences in fried rice um, as it travels to these different countries. It's important to trace, obviously, the immigration patterns, um, but also the regions of China that inspire certain types of cuisine that happen outside of the borders of China. Um, I went to Cuba, I think so it was like two summers ago, for fun, obviously, and had a sort of like mixed experience going to Cuba, uh, Havana's Chinatown. Um, I had expected these massive revelations because um, many of the cooks in my restaurant are they're Mexican, uh, they're Dominican, they're Cuban, they're Puerto Rican, and we always have a fried rice. And some people would say things like, "Oh, you know, like we put soy sauce in ours," and someone else would say, "You know what? We put Dominican salami in ours." And somebody else might say, "You know, like I always use this like red dyed pork product similar to char siu," and we would have these fascinating conversations. And then when we went, when I went to Havana, and when I went to Cuba's Chinatown, I was sort of like bewildered by what by what I saw. Um, it's a very, very small, it's a very, very small place, right? Um, it's got probably no more than 10 restaurants uh, on in Havana's Chinatown. Um, and the fried rice is mostly soy sauce fried rice. Um, we had a couple from a couple of restaurants. Um, but there was some weird fascination, maybe some, some of you in the comments, some of you with the questions can help me understand this better. But for me, when I ordered fried rice and they said, hey, do you want it special? Do you want a gravy on top of it? It was with ham and cheese. And then we also ordered, uh, and on all of these restaurants, there was also a chicken cordon bleu, uh, also a pork cordon bleu, and then a beef cordon bleu, which is all these sort of like chicken, beef, and pork cutlets stuffed with ham and cheese. I don't understand where this com comes from. I imagine perhaps through Switzerland, perhaps through France, but point is, at some point, you have to revel in the mixture and the, the messiness of not really understanding where exactly or being able to pinpoint exactly where certain flavors come from and where certain like, recipes come from. Um, it was a confusing time in Chinatown, in Havana Chinatown for me personally. Um, but that's not to say that food wasn't delicious. That wasn't to say that um, that hasn't inspired some of the fried rice that we're going to be cooking today. Great. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about the times that I've been to Cuba and it's been magical. It's been electric. It's been, I guess, beyond what one can expect. Um, we should talk about Cuban history, the embargo um, being situated in the United States and a kind of time capsule that people seem to like fetishize Cuba as this Caribbean getaway, as Latin American. And we have these 1950 style cars. Um, and then people seem to pride themselves when they know that, oh, there are Cuban Chinese people and there's a Chinatown. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of giving a mini lecture to contextualize the history of the Chinese in Cuba and defining Chineseness. Um, you know, you're probably wondering, who is this woman named Tao? That sounds Chinese, but she looks black. Um, when I was in Cuba, it would be common to be called La China or Chinita on the street um, by people there. And it's because there's a similar history across various Caribbean islands of Chinese influence migration for over 150 years now. So I think that it's going to be really great for us to talk about what people expect when they travel to the Caribbean, um, tourism, the kind of extractive nature of it and what it means to consume, to eat um, food, and to look for like an authentic Chinese-ness that one perhaps will never find. So uh, fried rice is definitely a favorite of mine. Um, growing up being Jamaican Chinese, actually originally from London, I always find that Chinatowns are um, a place that I feel at home in the world, wherever they're located. So I'd love to talk about like British Chinese fried rice, um, I love crab, like Thai fried rice. I love so many different types of fried rice. It was hard for me to decide on which one to cook today. But the one that I'm going to cook is Cuban inspired, not the type that you would get in Cuba, but sort of an homage um, to a kind of homeliness um, as far as different fried rices that you will find across the Caribbean. So it's going to be a kind of love letter of leftovers of not just simply throwing everything in the pan, but thinking about nutrition, thinking about labor, thinking about histories of violence, thinking about histories of racial slavery and indenture. Um, so I'm excited for us to kind of 
get into some history, to do some cooking, to do some eating, um, and yeah, just to share our experiences through food um, to tell a story of diaspora. I'll let you take it away with the, with the lecture. Cool, yeah, I can jump right in. All right, so I've prepared a few slides in true professor fashion. So I guess you're getting a taste of night school with Prof Goff. <laughs> um, so Caribbean Chinese fried rice, a love letter to colonial leftovers. So I think it's really um, important to think about what it means to be leftover as a metaphor. Um, these images on the screen that you can see are um, a kind of story through images in terms of my family history. So on the right, you can see this passport image of my grandfather who grew up in Hong Kong, where Lucas is from, in fact. Um, and we see the stamp across my grandfather's face. So this was a passport photo taken in 1934 and it says canceled. Um, I sat with this picture and thought about what it meant for him to be Afro-Chinese, so to be born to a Black Jamaican mother, a Chinese father, who we see pictured on the left there, um, who actually migrated from Hong Kong to Jamaica in the 1920s. And in the middle there, you can see a map of Jamaica and Chinese text beneath it to kind of gesture to the question of translation between African diasporic culture and Chinese diasporic culture and how there's a, a circuitry between Hong Kong as a British um, colony and Kingston, Jamaica, um, also as part of this colonial circuitry. So there's a lot that we can kind of um, think about in terms of the layers of history and the layers of violence of colonialism and that we can eat in terms of the food, food as a resource, food as a, a source of nutrition and food as a place to, um, you know, think about art, to think about cuisine um, and what it tells us about a kind of artistry of these people from centuries ago. So racial indenture is a term that I use to describe this labor migration of um, men largely from South China who migrated in the 1850s um, and in an earlier period as well to the Caribbean. So um, in terms of Cuba, it was about 100,000 Chinese men who were, um, let's say, transported to the Caribbean, usually under false pretenses at the time that slavery was still taking place in Cuba. So the Spanish um, brought them there to labor on plantations alongside enslaved Africans. So one can imagine um, that it's significant as we can see, um, or you can see before on my screen, that contracts were signed. These were supposedly contract laborers. But we have to kind of think about the question of racial slavery as being one where people are being transformed legally into property and the way in which um, European colonies tried to replace that system of labor by saying, okay, we're going to um, get rid of slavery and now bring in um, indentured laborers who have consented to being here. So you can imagine abuses take place and um, there was no actual consent in terms of these contracts that were being signed across different languages. And on this slide here, you can see a dietary scale that actually lists what these laborers were um, afforded. So by the British, by the Spanish, by the French, um, in terms of this journey across the Atlantic from South China to the Caribbean. So here we have salted beef, salted pork, salted fish. Um, we have lime, we have pickles, and very importantly, we have rice, what we're here to talk about today. So this timeline of racial indenture is one that really um, preoccupies the work that I do in teaching about African and Asian histories, and that there's a long history of Chinese people um, across the Western hemisphere. So um, I'm not gonna go through all of these dates. You probably remember from history class, you know, the kind of pivotal points, the American Revolution in 1776, et cetera but fewer people have actually learned about Chinese exclusion, which began in 1882. So fewer people even know that Chinese exclusion didn't end until 1943. So during that period, there was a ban on Chinese people um, being able to migrate to the United States. So 
that's one part of history that is little understood, but lesser understood is what that meant for other countries across the hemisphere. So alongside these kinds of different timelines, we have to then think about the question of um, Cuba as a nation, right? So in 1959, we have the Cuban Revolution. 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what we get is an actual departure of most people who were Cuban Chinese. So people who had been in Cuba from the 1850s to the present um, or to that moment in the 1960s who were getting nervous because they were shopkeepers, they were a bourgeoisie, a middle class um, that had a certain amount of capital. So as Cuba becomes communist, um, socialist, we actually get a departure of Chinese who end up um, by and large migrating to cities like New York. And then we get this Cuban Chinese food craze of the 1960s um, where you could find Chinese food, Cuban Chinese food in particular, across New York City. So the themes that I want us to kind of think about today as we're cooking are Cuba, um, so trying to not romanticize and fetishize it and to understand what it has meant um, for them in the embargo. I also want us to think about a kind of diasporic imperialism. So against the kind of Han ethno-nationalism and su supremacy that tends to kind of come out in terms of food. So I hope that we can talk about the specificity of Hakka cuisine. So that's um, actually a part of my ancestry and of the Chinese who went to Jamaica. They're part of this group of people called Hakka Chinese who consider themselves to be Han, but are a minority group within China. And then finally, I mean, I hope we can talk about how um, fusion cuisines and authenticity <laughs> are the kind of buzzwords of food, TV, and um, popular culture. But as Lucas and I have talked about when he's guest lectured at Cornell, fusion is a very tricky word and we're gonna push against it and what it means. And I always tell my students, authenticity does not exist. So um, I just wanna show you this image of an artist who has meant a lot to me, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. So she is Afro-Chinese, she's Cuban, and a lot of her work is about food, but it's also about her Chinese ancestry and playing around with the idea that people see her and can't understand that she's Chinese, that she is descended um, from laborers from this period of racial indenture who toiled away on sugarcane plantations. Um, in the Cuban countryside. So in this image, my, my mother told me I was Chinese. We can get a sense of um, what she's playing around with in this kind of brocade, if I go back a bit. Um, this kind of performance of Orientalism and a kind of self-Orientalism as she tries to understand her heritage um, and the presence of the Chinese in Cuba for 150 years. So I just wanted to share a few pictures <laughs> very quickly, just to bring some color to um, what uh, Chinatown looks like in Havana. Like it might be hard to imagine. Um, and we talked a bit, Lucas and I, about um, the experience visiting there. But even though people seem to say like, oh, it's so tiny, it's so small, there's not many restaurants. I felt like it was just big enough for me because I don't know, I just felt at home and the people who would talk to me on the street and also these arches I found quite um, interesting since we don't have that kind of um, architecture in Manhattan Chinatown, which is where I live near. So here's just a couple of images um, looking at family associations. So it was littered, the, um, the Chinatown there with different signs with Chinese characters and names um, and family associations. And we could talk about how this is a kind of organizing for immigrant communities. Um, and here's pictures of presidents of the associations. So we can get a sense of the history of the Chinese in Cuba and really think about what it means to be Chinese in Cuba. So here's a, a, a menu from a restaurant called Il Chinito. And it's interesting to me that it's actually inside one of the family associations. So there's a kind of secret world to Chinatown in Cuba. And the people that you see there might not look Chinese at all, right? They might look like me. Um, so there's a whole secret world in Cuba. Um, if we think about the many various religions um, that have to kind of be undercover and not present to the government. Uh, and here on the left, we can see a shrine within one of the family associations that I was able to visit. And um, on the right, we can see there some of an elder 
from uh, Havana Chinatown who I was able to meet. Um, and then on the right there is um, a woman who was able to introduce me to the community. Um, and yeah, people might think, oh, she doesn't look Chinese or I don't look Chinese. And that's why people often will say, oh, there's only a um, hundred Chinese people left in Cuba who are native Chinese. But it begs us to kind of question, like, what does it mean to be Chinese? So the question of resistance is important to my work, um, especially as we're, you know, reeling from what happened in Atlanta in terms of anti-Asian violence. And, you know, as a historian, I sit with these questions of the colonial archive from the 1870s. And here's an example of what we can learn through food. So here we have a deposition signifying the resistance of these laborers who were, you know, mutilated. They were beaten. They were, they lived um, in horrible conditions. So we have here, Li Chao Chen and 165 others state that when they left Macau, we proceeded to the sea and we were confined in the hold below. Some were even shut up in bamboo cages or chained to iron posts. A few were indiscriminately selected and flogged as a means of intimidating all others. Whilst we cannot estimate the deaths that in all took place from sickness, blows, thirst, hunger, or by suicide leaping into the sea. So this is really significant for us to be able to sit with in terms of how it was that the Cuba Commission report was um, a, a listing of depositions by these men who were resisting against the conditions that they were put under. Um, and as a result, the, the trade in terms of uh, Chinese laborers was abolished because China then stepped in to, to say to Cuba, this is not okay what you're doing to our citizens. So there's many examples where food shows up and we can see this kind of laceration of the body is a common theme. Um, and I really just want to point people to uh, historian Kathleen Lopez, who has really done incredible work and her book Chinese Cubans can tell you much more about the texture of this history of Chinese people in um, Cuba. So in one instance, she tells us about how their diets were forced to be changed. So a typical meal in South China, she says, consisted of rice with meat and vegetables. So quite similar to what we're about to do with fried rice, but that had to be substituted as to the breakfast of the laborers. So these would have been enslaved Africans that they were eating alongside. They were sleeping in the same barracks. They were there together. Um, so what was replaced was boiled jerk beef, boiled sweet potatoes, and they were fed in a large wooden box. So they were treated quite literally like animals. And it's significant for us to think about what that means in the space of the plantation and how degrading it would have been. So just to give you a sense of the kinds of injury and mutilation that these uh, Chinese laborers went through, I've kind of combed through the colonial archive and we can see here um, in terms of what the British colonials are noting. So this is in Jamaica, that there are scars on this person's forehead, um, scar on the skull, cuts on the head, scar on the left temple, burns on the forehead, deep scars on the right breast. And these bodily marks were used to identify the laborers because they could not identify them through language because of what was lost in translation. Um, so there's a lot going on there in terms of anti-Asian racism and violence. And I think if we look at this deeper history, then we can let go of this kind of quest for authenticity. Because what does it mean to be authentic? <laughs> what does it mean to know the Chinese experience in the Caribbean? I think it would have to be to look at history and to understand this violence as part of where we get this food from, in fact, as a resource, as something positive that comes beyond the suffering. So fusion is something that I would love to kind of trouble in the question and answers um, part of today. And um, I bring it up just because someone once asked me what kind of fusion I am. <laughs> as an Afro-Chinese person, I didn't find it that entertaining. I was quite confused at the time, but I tend to associate fusion food with the 1990s, like Sex in the City and a kind of um, confection that doesn't represent a kind of long history that we're looking at in terms of Cuba, in terms of other parts of the Caribbean and Latin America. So I want you to take away that Caribbean Chinese food is not fusion food. It's its own food and cuisine <laughs> that represents over 150 years of struggle, but also resilience, right? As we saw in the depositions. 
So as a kind of takeaway as well, I would love for us to sit with the ways in which eating is relational. Um, digestion is important in terms of thinking about how history is formed and that we can understand food writing as life writing. So recipes tell a story. Um, and when I think about my work as a DJ, it's a kind of mixtape that can also be understood as a love letter. So we've done a number of events in the past um, that have looked at these questions that uh, Lucas and I, in terms of chop suey and the supper club that we had, but I've also hosted events looking at this question of the pandemic right now, framed as racial contagion and racial enclosure. Um, and I'm happy to speak to these questions of yellow peril um, and what it means to consider that it took a so-called Chinese virus for Black Lives to Matter, like the convergence of Afro-Asia, I'd be happy to speak about later on. So here's an image um, of chop suey, <laughs> just to kind of harken back to what Lucas and I did last summer in terms of cooking and really thinking about chop suey as a remix. And um, I also wanted to note that I have an event coming up on May 20th, so with the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, where I'll be cooking platanos. So if you want to join me in that, please do. Um, and I think that cooking ultimately for me has been a source of healing. So you can check out my Instagram, Gastropoetics of Tao, in which over the past year, so since last April, um, I really just began cooking. I didn't cook before that at all. I was writing about food as a professor, but um, the pandemic really led me to think critically about what labor goes into this food, um, as well as the labor histories that surround it. So here are some images of different dishes that I've cooked, as well as um, Chinatown in Manhattan, where I live. Um, so yeah, again, eating is relational. It's um, part of the sensorium that we should tune into in terms of taste, in terms of smell, all of these things working in communion. And I'm excited to, um, yeah, get into some cooking <laughs> now that I've kind of given you a little overview of the history. But um, what we're going to do now is actually look at a little video to kind of pay homage to a restaurant that shuttered recently called La Caridad 78. So this is on 78th Street, um, and it really was an institution in terms of Manhattan, in terms of New York, um, a Cuban Chinese restaurant. And I often would take my students there um, when I was teaching at New York University. So on field trips where I would go all the way uptown and get them food to bring back for events that we would hold. You can't, you can't talk about Cuban Chinese food almost without mentioning Cuban Chinese food in New York. And it's honestly such a bummer. I hope some of you have been to La Caridad. Um, it's like, all of this aside, it's one of the most delicious Chinese experiences I've had in New York. It's consistently amazing food. Um, and it's such a bummer that they're not around anymore. But that's not to say that you don't have an opportunity to look for Chino Latino cooking um, outside of La Caridad all over New York. Um, I think a lot of, it would be, if we had another hour, I would love to rhapsodize on how the impact of Chinese people cooking for Latinx communities has caused Chinese American food in and of itself to change, in and of itself to continue to evolve. Um, but, but I'm hungry, so... <laughs> <laughs> you got to start cooking. Can you tell us what's happening? Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. And honestly, it's so inspired for me by the guys that we just saw in the video. And I just feel so nostalgic and sad to know that it's shuttered, this institution in New York. Um, yeah. and they, and so this they is an ode. No, go ahead. Yeah, and I think that we find so many restaurants that are kind of... Uh, you know, selling food for $25 a plate for an entree that are like, oh, Cuban Chinese fusion. But the thing about La Caridad is that it felt like a New York diner. Like it was just so New York. Mm -hmm. The guys there, yeah, would switch between Spanish, between, um, and like Cuban Spanish, right? And between um, Cantonese in a way that really reminded me like of my family members um, and that kind of code switching, mm -hmm. as well as, um, yeah just being so friendly. They felt like uncle in a sense. So I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm heating up this pan. And it's interesting, you know, thinking about the similarities between different rice dishes in different cultures. Like, mm -hmm. what would it be like to use a paella pan for this 
or versus a walk <laughs> and to maybe have like a soap karat, like the, the kind of texture of a paella with fried rice. So those are things that we could think about experimenting with. But I wanted for this recipe to kind of just keep it as simple in that kind of homage to New York diner food and to the way in which at La Caridad, it was always like a kind of side. Like you had to either get with the dishes as main, like white rice with like rice and beans or fried rice. Yes. So it was always just like there. Um, you could have it as its own dish, but it, it always was an accompaniment. So yeah. again, the leftovers are so important here. Um, fried rice is, you know, what's the weird thing about fried rice is, you know, back in China, um, uh, fried rice is hard. It's not a home cooked dish. Um, it's a, it's always um, as oftentimes as a side dish. Um, but what's even more interesting is in uh, places outside of China, fried rice has become a dish that comes with uh, other stuff, like in combo meals, right? You might get general sows with fried rice on the vegetable, fried rice on the side. Um, yeah. And as you're cooking, by the way, if you have any questions about what's happening, uh, Tao's going to show her Cuban fried rice that can eventually become the base of the fried rice, that the Fujianese Hokkien fried rice that I'll show you guys how to make. Um, if you have any questions, throw them down into the, into the chat, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Tao, there's one quick question for people in the Bronx. Sure. Um, somebody who can't find bacalao or sushi broth, what is your advice on any substitutions? Um, I mean, I think that the seafood broth is just a nice addition at the end, which to me seems more like the Spanish influence. Um, if you can't find bacalao, which is also the Spanish influence that I was going for, then just really substitute it with, um, I had said lechon asado, or if you have lap chong. So I don't eat meat, so I'm not going to be including that. But to me, those are like Spanish flavor um, profiles that you can add for a saltiness. Absolutely. And most of all, I think it's just like you don't need to add soy sauce <laughs> or not much soy sauce or salt because the salt in the bacalao is already doing so much to season. Um, and again, it was kind of like important for it to be a complete meal all in one um, for that kind of nourishment for people who were poor, you know, who were coming out of um, after the plantation. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to think about it as a complete and balanced meal. So whatever protein you want to throw in there, definitely it's, yeah. it's a remix dish. So so go for it. And I'm sure there's plenty of substitutes in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, in terms of things like um, dried uh, things like dried scallop, or um, there's actually a, a thing we call yo song, uh, <laughs> yu song, um, which is a dried fish that's cooked and cooked and cooked until it's like floss, like pork floss with made of fish. That might be interesting too. Um, Tao, what are you doing? Yeah, this now? Is, so yeah, this is just, I mean, basically the, you just need the umami ingredient for the, the bacalao <laughs> replacement. Sure. So I, I don't know, I, I find that this is kind of like a holy trinity, like you find in French cooking, right? So you have the mirepoix, but um, I did my mise beforehand, so it's pretty simple if you have everything prepared. So what we have here is scallions, um, Spanish onions, dice. Um, usually I would dice them much smaller, but I'm gonna try and keep it to like have a la caridad. They're like kind of these thicker cuts of onions um, and garlic just for a kind of flavoring. Beautiful. So I have here um, the bacalao, which I let soak overnight. That's key because otherwise it will be way too salty. Um, and I'm really just gonna cook, cook it out with the um, onions, to kind of create a flavor and a base for when I'm going to add the rice. Beautiful. So, so yeah, the rice is really, um, I guess I'm, I'm giving you a kind of shortcut that's about leftovers, <laughs> which yes. is that I'm not cooking the rice myself. I obviously could, and I would also recommend using a rice cooker is not cheating either. Like across Asia, it's so common. Um, and in Asian diasporic households to find that. But one better way to do it is to support Chinese restaurants, Chinese American restaurants, whatever is your local. Um, you always get these kind of bonus boxes of white rice. Um, and maybe you eat them or maybe you don't, but it can be nice to order that and then save it to um, make yourself a meal. Let's talk about why so, rice is so excellent for fried rice, right? 
So the perfect yeah. fried rice is always not only a flavorful, a flavorful triumph, but a textural one. And the the the, the term for it is uh, probably um, what we call lily fleming or lily fenming. And what happens is you have all of these little grains of rice that are separate from each other. And so you can taste each and every gra rice grain and each and every rice grain is coated in all of those flavors. So in order to get that, um, scientifically, what you're hoping for is you have rice grains that have the surface starch washed off or dried off. And the best way to do that is actually to cook rice with a little bit less water than you normally do or, or and or leave it to sit out overnight. As it sits overnight, it loses a little bit extra bit of that moisture and your rice won't be as gummy and your rice won't stick to each other as you're stir frying it. No matter what type of fried rice you're making, any type, any part of the world, that's always the best way to make fried rice um, to get the texture that you want. And honestly, most times people don't have delicious fried rice is when the rice starts to clump in the pan and that's always because there's too much moisture. So overnight fried rice from a local takeout joint is always a really easy way to guarantee success. Yeah, it's kind of been like a co-production because they're cooking it like in large vats over the day. So you're not wasting the food mm -hmm. and definitely overnight is the way. So def like my mother taught me how to cook fried rice. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was my only Chinese inheritance in terms of Jamaican Chinese food. Um, and yeah, this is not the kind of fried rice that I grew up cooking, but it's mm -hmm. definitely influenced by that. And it was always in what my mother had taught me as well, that overnight fried rice or overnight rice, like you're saying. So not fresh rice. It's actually better for it to be yeah. like a day old yeah. if you had ordered um, the night before. So now that you're seeing a little bit of color in your bacalao and your aromatics, the rice is going into the pan, right? Yeah. So I'm adding the rice so that it actually will get cooked. Gorgeous. There we go. And you can be generous with it. Um, it is a bit clumped, but it'll, it'll start to apart. cook as you kind of. As it gets heat, it'll start to come apart. Yeah. Delicious. Um, but yeah, I added, um, while you were talking before, Lucas, some shrimp mm -hmm. and scallops. So this is going to be a pescatarian fried rice. Um, and I think that's just the beautiful thing about the Caribbean. There's seafood. These islands are surrounded by water. It's great to be able to support local fishermen when you're there. I also see the Havana Club in the corner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something you were drinking before or after? Oh, so, yeah. I was thinking this would be a nice way to celebrate afterward. And just to think about the embargo and the fact that we don't get to have products like Havana Club. So I actually got that from um, the Netherlands when I was there, um, living there um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm halfway through the last bottle that I was able to buy <laughs> from the Netherlands. And I think it's just a nice kind of tribute to La Caridad 78 to think about um, this ongoing embargo and what it means for people who live in Cuba um, and what it means for those who left, right? Who were the affluent people who tended to be white um, but also the Chinese as part of this um, so-called exodus or migration away from the island. Mm -hmm. the, um, so for them, I'm sure Havana Club is also a, a kind of nostalgic memory for what they can't have anymore. <laughs> yeah, for me, a lot of the my experience with Havana Club is the lack thereof of memory. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Imani is asking, uh, I don't have an answer to this, so I'm turning to you. Um, if, do you know of any connections, any diasporic connections between fried Chinese macaroni and fried rice? No, I actually haven't heard of fried Chinese macaroni. Me neither. I know of Chinese <laughs> macaroni in Hong Kong, uh, uh -huh. in South China, you know, in Ta Chantang's, and we eat it for breakfast, and I've mm -hmm. seen it tossed in like a bolognese kind of like tomato sauce before. Um, macaroni being right. a very, very accessible, easy to transport version of pasta, um, therefore being a reaction to sort of uh, British colonialism and, and, and European cooking techniques, right? Um, but I am, I'm not totally sure about fried macaroni. Uh, yeah, I wonder. I mean, macaroni itself has a really fascinating etymology and history, like that song, um, like put a feather in its cap and call it, macaroni or something like that it 
I remember reading about it and it, it has like a British and also an Italian connection. Right. Um, but that's reminding me, like when I visited Hong Kong, I was really intrigued that the fancy food there seemed to be like Italian restaurants. Mm-hmm. Is that the case, or was that was I just kind of uh, back in the day? Sort of um, the the fanciest uh, sort of like Chinese. So there's this whole Cantonese or rather Hong Kong style Western food, which is uh, the product of Hong Kong people wanting to um, uh, kind of reach for a European lifestyle and cooking with it, cooking in that direction with limited resources. And um, cha tang okay. is a Hong Kong style diner that's. Uh, <laughs> Of entry level, but on top of that, you also have steakhouses. You also have these like kind of like pasta, pasta um, uh, uh, restaurants. Yeah, that's what I noticed. Yeah, um, and I was you wondering. Know, you do this thing. It's like you can't get high quality beef, so you just drown your um, the cheap cuts of beef when baking soda, for example. Um, there's a very nostalgic <laughs> flavor um, there. Um, but back to you. What's happening in the pan right now? So, how do you know when to add the vegetables? So these are actually frozen. Um, and again, this is part of my ode to La Caridad. I probably, if I was going to make it more gourmet, um, I've been like resisting doing that. And from what I remember of the mouthfeel, there was always this kind of, um, you know, it came out of the bag, like frozen peas right. and carrots. So it doesn't, it's, you don't even have to defrost it. I think you can cook with um, frozen peas. I prefer actually, I shouldn't say it, over fresh peas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Also reminds me of just childhood and, it's just a great way to get your greens in, um, fried rice, and just adding whatever vegetables. So um, once the protein is cooked, I would just add the vegetables in so that they don't overcook and get soggy. Many of these fried rice dishes um, across sort of all these different countries have uh, peas and carrots. Um, and I, I, I'm not the historian, but I can only assume that it's out of a fa- out of convenience, you know, um, that. You, you can always toss perfectly diced, ready to go, with the perfect shape, they cook in the right amount of time. Um, so, you know, what some people might call Dominican, you know, chofan or Peruvian chofan, like all of it is gonna, uh, most of the time includes some type of vegetables like this. And is that cabbage you're putting in right now? Yeah, so this is Napa cabbage. Mm-hmm. So to even further like bastardize it <laughs> and be unauthentic, um, I've taken to adding lettuce or cabbage to really like fortify it. Um, and it's, it gives it such a great texture. Yes. Yeah. Um, at, at Nice Day Chinese, at one of the restaurants that I run, um, our cabbage and our fried rice is about 25% cabbage um, because of how good the texture of cabbage is and how it holds. Oh, good. Yeah. Napa cabbage is really rice. great. Napa cabbage is also um, mm-hmm. We have a question about using dried shrimp and fried rice. Um, uh, be, uh, because Debbie rec- uh, um, remembers uh, Jamaican Chinese, um, and Jamaican Gi- Chinese grandfather used to uh, use dried shrimp and fried rice. Dried shrimp is really, really excellent fried rice. I'll tell you two instances when I've used it before. The first time, um, and kind of the traditional way in a lot of fried rices, um, is as Tao was saying, you're looking for umami, you're looking for that bakalao, like salty seafood. Um, savoriness. So you'll take little tiny shri- um, uh, dried shrimp and you'll uh, rehydrate it for you know 15 minutes in water or something, drain that water off and throw that in about the time when um, Tao is throwing in her bacalao. Um, the, the Cantonese version that I've had at sort of like banquet type of fancy settings is oftentimes a dried shrimp, scallops and or dried scallops and egg whites um, because it looks kind of like nice and elegant and all these things. Um, but on the other hand, um, recently I've been really loving this sort of modern take on using dry shrimp on fried rice, um, where I will take the dry shrimp that you buy at the regular restaurant and you won't rehydrate it, but you can drop it in oil and get it to crisp up almost like croutons, right? Almost like bacon bits. You chop them, you might chop them up a little nice and fine, just throw them in oil and they'll deep fry, they'll float to the top, they'll become like bright red, bright orange. And then you have this sort of like crouton bacon bits type of like uh, topping on top of fried rice that I've really, really enjoyed. Um, if you under season your fried rice a little bit and you have these like salty bits on top, it's, it's really nice. Nice fluffy fried rice, nice crispy bits of shrimp over the top. Yeah, I think it's great when fried rice can be the main um, attraction. So it's just, I think, have fun with it. Substitute things. Um, I like dried shrimp, but I think it, it just depends on taste and what's available. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I would say dried mushrooms are a big part of Jamaican Chinese cuisine. Um, also, like I guess the memory I have of growing up is 
like these fish balls. You know what I'm talking about, these fish? Yes. Yeah, like fish those frozen balls. ones. <laughs> so like when I think of I'm Jamaican Chinese right, right. food, I think of that. But I think my grandfather in Hong Kong, like that was just a flavor profile or ingredient that he loved to cook with. There's a oh, and good... then the other thing is that men are the ones who cook in Hakka, um, in Hakka communities and traditions. So it was my grandfather who was the one that was cooking a lot in terms of Chinese food. Hakka Chinese, uh, the Hakka people are, um, the Chinese word for Hakka is kejia, which means, or Hakka, which means um, the, the guest people or the visitor people. Um, the Hakka people were some of the first people to even arrive in Hong Kong, for example, outside of people who were natively you know, in Hong Kong. Uh, so the Hakka people are responsible for a lot of the dispersion for a lot of these Southern Chinese um, culinary ideas throughout the world because you know you can imagine that if a certain group of people are more willing to move into different parts of China, they also are very more likely to be the first immigrants to other countries. Um, Hakka people were the first people to go into um, uh, India, for example, um, and they play the Hakka people and Hakka cooking plays a huge role in the Fujianese type of fried rice that I'll show you. So I believe Tao is mixing up some eggs right now um, that are going yeah. to finish off her fried rice. And I think a lot of people say to do the eggs first, but I don't like eggs to be overcooked. So I kind of like doing it at the side of the pan. Yes, that is a very because it's kind of fun to, to watch it and let it cook and then disperse it in. Um, yeah. But I didn't learn to do it that way from my family. I think it was more like, oh, you kind of make scrambled eggs, just throw everything in there and then just mm -hmm. cook it and eat it. <laughs> so I've been adding my own. Right on the, side is, the technique of pushing your rice on the side is very, very smart because that means you don't have to wash another pan and you don't have to do this thing where you cook the eggs, put it on the side <laughs> and put it back. Um, that's how I cook my rice. Um, uh, the, the technique I use is technically called golden fried rice, and the egg whites are cooked um, on the side of the pan while the rice has already been cooking, so you don't have to reset the pan or do anything like that. Um, part of the, as you say, leftovers, right? So efficiency, accessibility, <laughs> convenience, huge part of it. If you can cook it in the same darn pan, keep it in the same darn pan. Yeah, I didn't want to say that I'm just too lazy to use a separate no. plan, but that's it's also whole, fun. That's a philosophy of the whole thing. <laughs> so as the eggs are actually, it, it mixes in more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It has it the flavor more. of the onions. Culinary Yeah, I think you're not going to be able to overcook the rice, but make sure that you don't overcook the eggs. Um, and this is kind of influenced by um, when my sister and I went to. Uh, the UK in 2008, we had the most amazing fried rice in London, Chinatown, and there was no soy sauce in it at all. It was just white and it was so flavorful. I feel like we've been trying to find that kind of fried rice forever. Um, so I think using less soy sauce is better. Um, and it's kind of just trying to figure out how to get that um, umami flavor mm -hmm. without it being like covered in um, soy sauce because the color will look different, but also that's not healthy. Um, the, uh, let's talk about soy sauce and fried rice for a second because mm -hmm. I'm a very opinionated chef and I don't really love soy sauce in my fried rice, but uh, yeah. after being, being in New York for a couple of years, actually I'll tell you why I didn't like soy sauce in my fried rice because soy sauce, in order to achieve the texture that you want, you want as little moisture introduced in there as possible, right? You want right. it to be like nice and fluffy and all these things but mm -hmm. um the uh, uh and adding a liquid seasoning to it is antithetical to achieve an goal however upon time and understanding how soy sauce functions um i've come to understand that soy sauce and fried rice is especially effective if you're adding it into fried rice that you're cooking inside of a very very hot wok the reason is because ah. so you can add it directly to the rice, it's added directly to the side of the pan, where mm -hmm. the inside of the soy sauce will immediately caramelize and it'll produce this beautiful color. And then you'll get a different sort of like, um, you'll get a little bit of an edge on that soy sauce. Um, and when it's stir fried together, as is most of the cases in um, well, fried rice in uh, fried rice in uh, Le Cairodad, for example, mm -hmm. you get a, a different sort of that you wouldn't be able to get without that soy sauce. Um, we have a question from David 
Who's sure. asking for a little bit of clarification about step eight in the recipe? I'm not exactly sure what step eight is, but he's having he needs a little bit of help clarifying. Okay, so would someone be able to read step step eight for me? It might have been um, where I just added the the stock at the end, possibly, oh, yeah. or when I added the soy sauce and the oyster sauce. Have you done that right now in your pen? Yeah, so I'm basically done. Oh, cool. <laughs> when you were talking. <laughs> but it was about the soy sauce. So those are the two main, um, I guess, things to, to be aware of. It's just towards the end, um, you're going to be adding the oyster sauce, making sure that you're, you know, that it's uniform throughout. But as you can see here, right, you don't, it doesn't look brown. So there's just enough of it um, to flavor. And it's just a personal preference of mine that I like um, oyster sauce, which I feel like is very Jamaican Chinese. And I've been tracing the ways in which that's part of South Chinese cuisine um, and flavor profiles. So it makes a lot of sense to me if we think about the Pearl River Delta. Um, so if someone's able to read it. <laughs> yeah, he actually wanted to know about the uh, egg white part of the question. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's something that I actually wanted to ask you, Lucas. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been looking up like how to cook, yeah, with a very hot wok and to make like, um, I guess what I, I found it was called this egg swampoa, but just like a style of cooking an omelet, like a Chinese omelet. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've been learning is to kind of separate the whites and the yolk. And I found that it adds something different as well as if you can add cornstarch to make the eggs have a different texture, yes. almost similar to what we were doing in the chop suey demo. Um, yeah. So now I just always whisk my egg whites and yolks separately. And I don't know, something feels right about it, but I would love to know about the gastronomy or if yeah. you do that or not. Yeah, actually it's that, that kind of part of it is in my demo. I'll answer that when we move to ours. <laughs> Your fried rice looks great. Um, are you almost done? I'm done. Whoa, <laughs> you're done? So I'm gonna um, plate. Um, cool. I had a more interesting tool to plate, um, but yeah, here it is. So I'll hold it up to the, the camera under here. Cool. What's on the side? So that you can see. So what's on the side is what's always on the side, <laughs> which is platano. <laughs> In true La Caridad fashion, right? Um, yes. So here it is with it's a side gorgeous. of plantains, sweet caramelized plantains with a little bit of brown sugar. Mm -hmm. um, and there's our fried rice. So I'm gonna add garnish of um, cilantro, or what I know in the British sense as coriander. Yes, um, beautiful. Because it really, you know, it's a, an ingredient that has these two names that speaks to the ways in which it's very prominent in um, Latinx cuisine, um, as well as in other parts of the world. So I think it's really a nice garnish to add on top, um, as well as, let's see, scallions, because <laughs> they're so necessary to yeah. Chinese cuisine and cooking. Um, and I'm sure we could probably talk for days about the different types of scallions or green onions. Um, but scallions are also really important to Jamaican cuisine more broadly um, and definitely coming from China. So there's much that we can kind of learn about the ways in which um, Chinese ingredients are a big part of Caribbean cooking. So what I'm doing now is just doing a kind of vertical slice, as I had said in the recipe, mm -hmm. to add this garnish. So for the home cooks like me, <laughs> who just started cooking. Um, this is just like a fun thing that I like to do at the end for when I, I take my pictures to put on Twitter and my Instagram. Um, so that it's like a vertical cut on the scallion. So yeah, that's me. That's my uh, Cuban Chinese fried rice inspired um, for the purists. It's not. I hope everyone who's at home is cooking together is on the same page. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea that we want to do with this demo is that 
we can build off of the fried rice that Tao made um, and additionally put a sauce on top of it, which is essentially what makes the fried rice that I will demonstrate for you today. Um, the, let me show you what I have in front of me uh, for your ingredients for the Fujianese fried rice. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history. Um, I know I said all these things about the textural importance of fried rice. Um, about it being light and fluffy and nice and dry and all these things. But at the end of the day, um, this is the one fried rice that defies our rule. If you look up Hokkien or Fujianese fried rice, and the reason why I chose this is because uh, Fujianese fried rice is very, very related to Hakka style cooking, which is very much water-based cooking, you'll find that this is one of the few fried rices in the world that has a sauce on it. The rice itself is relatively plain, but on top of it, you have this beautiful brown gravy. This beautiful brown gravy is going to be built off of not only the holy trinity of Chinese cooking, but also this magical thing that we have found to produce, produce an amount, immense amount of umami flavor, which is to combine animal protein from the land, like chicken, with an animal, with a animal protein from the sea, like shrimp. So what we're going to be doing today is I'll show you how to build a gravy. There are a couple of techniques involved there. Um, but the fried rice itself, you have a couple of options. Your first choice is to buy fried rice from your local takeout restaurant, and that can be your base. Your second choice is to cook cow fried rice or any type of fried rice that you want, regularly want to make at home. That could be the base. Or the third option is to make something like a basic fried rice, like what I have here, called golden fried rice. So this golden fried rice, to answer your egg question, is that um, the technique here is we're going to separate the egg whites and the egg yolks. Egg yolks are primarily made of lipids, um, so it's kind of like the fattier side of egg yolks. In this recipe, you would put that egg yolk into your rice before it's cooked and then stir fry it together with your aromatics, therefore causing you to have this like, beautiful lily fleming texture. texture. Or uh, the other half of the egg is the egg whites, which are a little bit more um, watery and there's a little bit more protein in there too. So with egg whites, the technique behind this huang pudan and like adding a little bit of cornstarch to the egg white is to fluff it up um, and to achieve a more, is to get the, basically you're trying to get the proteins to uh, capture these air bubbles in the egg white, kind of like making a meringue um, so that it can fluff up and get a little bit lighter and then add the egg yolks back into it later on before you stir fry. But that's kind of like the low, low, uh, quick and dirty science version of it. So anyway, um, here is my, uh, top camera. I want to make sure the team can see it. Um, here's my pen and we're going to begin building the sauce. What I'm doing today is I'm going to assume that your fried rice is already made. If you need a video demo, unfortunately for all of us, oh, you know what? I'm going to switch my mic over so that you can hear. Here we are. Tao, can you hear me okay? Good, amazing. Okay, so um, here is the golden fried rice that for better or for worse for my life, um, there are videos of me making this darn fried rice all over the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, look it up, it's on my Instagram. Just look up my name, Lucas Hen. It's on Bon Appetit, it's on everybody else's homepage too. Um, and this is a technique that I think is a surefire way to get this nice fluffy texture. So I'm going to dump this in the pan that I have on the back here, just to make sure that my fried rice is nice and hot. I'm going to concentrate on building the sauce here. So to begin with, this is a carbon steel pan. Um, you'll notice that it has high walls, very much like a wok, but my honest to God belief is that most people shouldn't be using woks at home if you're cooking for two people or less. The reason is because woks are kind of heavy and difficult to handle and at restaurants the reason why we use woks is because we're cooking at 700 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. At home you'll never be able to achieve that so you want as large of a surface area that's close to the flame as possible so you can get as much and harness as much of that heat and that energy as possible because you're never going to get that hot so you need more surface area to help you out with it. Here are my ingredients. Everything is diced up. To begin with, we have chicken. I'm using chicken thigh today. Chicken breast will work as well. We also have some shrimps. Some people like to dice up these shrimps. 
um, I like to keep them home because as Chinese people do, they like to show their prosperity um, and show the full shrimp. Um, the vegetables today are going to be a green vegetable. I have celery here, beautiful diced celery. You can also use something like Chinese broccoli, which is gailan, or asparagus. I have some fresh shiitake mushrooms and some carrots. My carrots and my mushrooms and my celery are diced a little bit smaller than my chicken because I know my chicken is going to reduce in size. So I'm going to let this well, guy... Just yes. We actually had a question um, about the Chinese Holy Trinity. So I see you've got your mies all set up there. What What is it to you? Is there a trinity? <laughs> yes, the trinity. In terms of the ingredients you have there. Um, it's actually, the trinity is actually <laughs> over in here. Garlic, ginger, and scallion. <laughs> um, garlic, ginger, and scallion is what we call our ginger, aromatic. Yeah. Aromatics mm -hmm. make up make up so much of that savory flavor profile. Back over here. Um, so my oil and my pan is starting to get a little hot. So I'm gonna throw in my chicken. We're gonna try to cook it and try to get it to brown. Cook your chicken the way you like to cook your chicken. Move it around, toss it if you want. Ooh. All we have to do is cook it. Would you like to marinate the chicken? Yes, you can. My chicken's a little marinated with a little bit of salt. It's not totally necessary. As the chicken is cooking, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about the seasonings that are gonna happen uh, in this pan a little bit later. First is soy sauce, also known as light soy sauce. Hmm. This is the right way? This is the right way? Oh, let me, am I horizontal? I see. Here you go. Can you see me now? Okay, yes. Yeah, now there we see go. the landscape. Mm -hmm. So much beautiful. So much more right. beautiful. Light soy sauce. Um, don't use dark soy sauce. Light soy sauce is primarily for sodium. Second thing, Shaoxing wine. Um, Shaoxing wine is our Chinese cooking wine, rice wine, it's a little amber. And the third thing is what people know as oyster sauce. This Sa Jian Hoyo, what's the English name? Sha Jing oyster sauce, write this down. This is the best oyster sauce you can get in New York, um, in my opinion. Um, it's almost doubly as concentrated. It's a lot like murkier in color. It's not black because it doesn't have that many, that much food coloring in it. Um, but actually, even more interesting, I like to substitute oyster sauce with this thing called abalone sauce. Oh, wow. Abalone sauce is, you know how abalone is one of the most expensive things in the world? Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a whole trade, right? <laughs> yeah, this is the sauce that's in the can with the most expensive stuff in the world. But this exactly. thing is four, luxurious. Five yeah. <laughs> Get all of that luxurious without the actual abalone, which makes it a lot cheaper. And it's also a little lighter in color. I really like this as a seafood flavor. So my yeah, chicken the flavor is a little different. My chicken is browning nicely. Once it's picked up this color, I'm going to add my shrimp. My goal here is simply to get my protein cooked. I'm going to maintain it at high heat. Once it's cooked, I'm going to start building the rest of the sauce. Oh my goodness, I hope nobody saw that. <laughs> Every culture that has delicious food has realized that chicken or land like surf and turf produces really incredible flavors um whether it's chorizo and shrimp or it's fish floss with pork floss in this case chicken with shrimp you just get a diverse amount of amino acids that produces amazing amounts of savory notes right like paella yes paella is built off of the same building blocks so I'm probably going to stay here for three or four or five minutes until my shrimp turn color. They're going to cook a little bit more later, but I just want to make sure they're nice and cooked over here. I love this. So this recipe is adapted from the wisdom of my mother. Uh, she is from uh, Fukin, from Fujian, and we went on a little bit of a pilgrimage to find the village that her family is supposed to be from a couple of years back and we had this dish Fujianese fried rice 
Um, you might wonder what the difference between Hokkien and Fujian is. Hokkien is the romanization based on the Fujianese language, Hokkien. Uh, Fujian is the uh, pinyin or Mandarin Chinese romanization of that word. They mean the same thing. So now that my shrimp are nice and curled up, nice and bouncy, my chicken looks to be cooked. I'm gonna take this off and return this back onto the heat. Now is the time for two cups of chicken stock. So this chicken stock here, homemade is always best. If you make it from powder, that's okay as well. If you get it from a box, that's also totally fine. So chicken stock is going in. What we're doing here is we just need to bring it to a boil. Are there any questions so far, or is this pretty self-evident? Yeah, I think we're, we're following. So you're bringing it to a boil. While this is happening, we're going to do a technique that in Hong Kong we call da hin. Um, and da hin is, um, uh, what's an English term for it? Um, we're making a slurry of cornstarch. So this is why some people like to describe Cantonese cooking or Chinese American cooking or so many of our sauces to be um, glossy, um, <laughs> or, unfortunately sometimes. But what mm. you're here is we're trying to find a quick way to encapsulate all that flavor together in the process of emulsification. There are flavors that are that live in that are best expressed. There are flavor compounds that are best expressed in oil, and there there are flavor compounds that are best expressed in water. You want to taste both of those things in every single bite. So you want the oil and the water to go together, and for that to happen, you need to have cornstarch with a little touch of water. Potato starch works, works well. Yolka starch also works. Um, but what you have here is a little bit of a slurry that's going to help us thicken our sauce. So we have a question about the slurry. Um, so David is asking, is this the sopita? Unfortunately, I don't speak, is that Spanish? <laughs> Perhaps. I don't speak the language, so I'm not quite sure what the reference is. Okay, um, neither do I. <laughs> but probably if it's about thickening a sauce with cornstarch and water, then this is, this is the sauce, this is the way to do it. Um, right, we're gonna it's stock. Mm -hmm. Right. So here's the running chicken stock. Um, you see it's coming to a boil, and then we're going to start um, cooking the vegetables and all those beautiful things in it to give it more flavor. So chicken stock is coming to a boil. Carrots going to go in first because they cook faster. And then we're going to put in our mushrooms. And we're going to put in our green vegetable. In this case for me, is celery. I'm making a lot more sauce than I need for one person as I'm cooking for today. We're going to bring this to a boil and we're just going to continue stirring it until all my vegetables are tender. This is actually wow. a pretty, I mean, it's, it's gorgeous because it's so many colors, very much like the fried rice that we love. But um, Hakka cooking and Hokkien cooking, uh, Fujianese cooking is very much a water-based um, uh, uh, type of cuisine. I mean, they're close to the water, they're right next to the water. And so um, this is actually kind of a boil or a poach. And in most other Western cuisines, or if you learn how to cook from, I don't know, Jamie Oliver or <laughs> like, like I did early on, um, you'll get a lot of like Western cooking where you, everyone is obsessed with browning and getting this nice deep umami flavor from coloring. Um, but it doesn't, it lacks the kind of, um, sometimes the, I suppose the elegance and the lightness that water-based cuisine can get. So um, I'm, a he I'm a big fan of this recipe because I'm not browning the mushrooms. I'm not browning or getting caramelization on the carrots. All I'm trying to do is coax that flavor out from beautiful vegetables with water and stock and make sure it's all nice and ready to go. Uh. So one other thing to add here I want to talk about is dried scallops. Um, dried scallops are, need to be rehydrated in water before you use them. If you don't want to use dried scallops or you don't have dried scallops, you can use something like exo sauce that has dried scallops inside of it. Mm. Um, I, I hope most of us are familiar with exo sauce because of how delicious it is. So I'm going to give it a oh good- God, it's amazing. 
<laughs> so exosauce basically is invented by people don't know this exosauce is invented very recently in like the last 20 or 30 years by a restaurant mm -hmm. that has different stars in the whole world all over asia and almost every single one of the league gardens has a michelin star um, so they have a ridiculous number of stars. Um, and part of why they're so successful is because they've invented this thing called exo sauce. And exo, in its original form, is a confit, or it's cooked in oil, of um, dried shrimps, jinhua ham, uh, dried shrimp, like we mentioned before, garlic, ginger, scallion, shallots. Um, and it produces, like we said, just basically a ridiculously gorgeous, um, uh, uh, really ridiculously umami, um, flavor. So we're going to add that in a little bit early here into our broth to make sure that it can cook into our vegetables and I can already smell it. So I'm just going to check here to make sure my carrots are kind of al dente and they're ready to go. Yep, they're good to go. They're diced nice and small. So at this point, it's been about one minute. My chicken and my shrimp are going to go in and then I'm going to add my seasoning as well. So it's going to start off with one teaspoon, or sorry, one tablespoon of soy sauce. This is mostly for color. Two tablespoons of shaoxing wine. Shaoxing wine provides a little bit of sweetness. It's also going to balance it out. It's important to bring that to a boil to get the alcohol to evaporate. And today I'm gonna to use the abalone. About two tablespoons here. This abalone with the soy sauce is going to be the main um, source of saltiness here, along with the chicken stock. And then just a little bit of sugar. The reason why Chinese people like to add sugar to savory dishes is for the same reason why you add salt to cupcakes. It's to make sweet things sweeter in cupcake form. Here, we're trying to make savory things more savory. Now you're starting to see this beautiful color. This amber brown. Most important part of the game is to taste it before we thicken it. Always keep tasting as you're adding things to the pan. Good. Good, good, good. Okay. If it needs sweetness, add sugar. If it needs a little bit more uh, of a wine edge, add a little bit more wine. If it needs a little bit more salt, add a bit more salt or abalone sauce or oyster sauce or whatever. But this is what you're looking for, nice and light. All the vegetables wow. are all there. Chicken and so shrimp all Season to taste. Season to taste, always season to taste. Well, season according to my recipe because my recipe is pretty good, but also. <laughs> so here's the cornstarch. Um, what I'm looking for here is shininess. Actually, oh shoot, I, before I, Go on. There are two more two more optional ingredients. One is sesame oil, and the other is white pepper. White pepper is always slightly fermented, so it gives a little bit of an edge, uh -huh. like floral quality to it that's beautiful. And what the sesame oil does, on top of adding sesame flavor, is it's going to give our sauce a little bit of gloss, about a teaspoon there. Um, it's going to make it a little bit more shiny and a little bit more attractive. I actually personally really don't like sesame oil as a flavor, very controversial, but very I like strong, right? Yeah, always. Yeah. Very... So yeah. cornstarch, we're going to add this in batches. I actually don't even think I have enough here. And then we're going to stir. And I have my white pepper too. I feel like that's very clutch. And always, <laughs> it looks like I'm going to need a little bit more cornstarch than I bargained for. Okay. But so for the day. texture. Yeah, I'm looking for the sauce to barely cling mm -hmm. to, to my ingredients. Okay, and that's when you know. So we have a question. Um, Adrian is asking, which yes. X sauce, X, which XO sauce do you recommend? And I'd love to know too, because I feel like I'm always trying to um, find it. It's not that easy to get, and it's expensive. <laughs> it tends to come in like little little jars. So what do you recommend, Lucas? Um, my exo sauce is so funny thing is i mentioned the restaurant lake garden and um uh I, I know the guy so he gave me like a case to bring home last time from hong kong 
Um, Ooh, from Hong Kong. You can only really get it in Asia. Um, uh, the of the popular ones, um, I actually like the Li Kam Ki EXO sauce. Um, they have a couple of levels. Um, EXO is obviously named after Hennessy, um, which is, in, in my opinion, also like a really cool, cool kind of like Afro Asian connection. Um, Definitely. But, <laughs> right. but uh, the third tier of EXO sauce um, made by Li Kam Ki is pretty good too, and it's available at most of the Asian um, supermarkets that I find. So as you can tell here, just to finish this off, I'm continually adding in stages because I don't want it to clump too much. But you see this? See this? Like back of your spoon thing? Like that's what I'm looking for. That's a good thickness. I'm going to turn this off now. And then we're going to plate. My favorite part. Wow. So much care goes into it. Uh, it's just, it's my job. So <laughs> here is the, here is my um, beaten up cut board. Mm -hmm. oh. This is what people want to learn usually. Um, bowl, plate, bowl, in goes fried rice. I warmed my fried rice from the side to make sure that it was good to eat. Beautiful yellow fried rice. Yellow rice also, if you see them at Chino Latino restaurants, usually isn't yellow because of the egg yolk. Most of the time it's yellow mm. because of um, achiote seeds or anado seeds. I'm pressing this down to make sure that it'll stay inside of the bowl. And this is my favorite way to plate um, fried rice in general, but also Fujinese fried rice. So here's that beautiful dome. Wow, and this is how the magic happens. We're going to make a little bit of a well. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to spoon some of that good stuff in the middle. Chinese people love to see the shrimp because it looks prosperous. <laughs> want some of it to dribble over, you want some of it to break it down. There you go. All these colors. You've got the lamb, the sea. Yep. Vegetables, the shrimp. all the elements. Of everything of the season. And wipe this off. <laughs> we love ourselves. Um, and we're not going to garnish it today because this is how I've always had it as is. But here is the very basic, but also really interesting because I've never had fried rice like this before where the bottom is so Lily Fleming it's like so fluffy and dry and top you just like put on this chop suey like um, brown mm -hmm. grape that has all these like flavors of the land and the sea and the vegetables um, maybe you just finish it off with a little bit more freshly ground white pepper and we'll call it a day Fujianese fried wow. rice beautiful <laughs> I hope we can have a dinner party in the future sometime so we can I put this hope. all, you know, on one table. Um, we had a question in the chat about cultural appropriation. It always comes up. <laughs> so I always tell my students, I'm not going to talk about cultural appropriation <laughs> or appreciation. Um, but I guess, Lucas, how do you tend to answer that question? I tend to kind of pivot towards history and really thinking about what is yeah. culture? What is appropriation? Um, what kind of love goes into cooking a dish like this? Um, yeah. Is it possible to appropriate it? Mm, I think, yes. Uh, I mean, um, to give a, my under, my, the way I do see the world is through food. And I always mm -hmm. feel like if you can understand the input into the machine, into the recipe, right? If you can understand the mechanisms of culture and history and immigration and migration and all these things, and if you can understand how those inputs go into the recipe and what causes each individual component of the recipe to be the way that it is, it's mm -hmm. a lot more easy to understand how one might appropriate it because they misunderstand some of those inputs. Um, yeah. uh, and oftentimes appropriation comes out from a lack of respect for the people who make it, um, right. or sometimes a lack of understanding um, of the people and where those people came from. Uh, as a chef- And I often think about, um, the restaurant Tao. So sometimes people say, oh, are you named after that restaurant or night club? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing restaurant. I'm like, if you want to think that, but, <laughs> but it just makes me think of like sex in the city and that kind of yeah. cultural yeah. appropriation culture of like 90s New York and yeah. other cosmopolitan no, cities I, where I, they don't I, care about this history or know it or know Chinese people. <laughs> yeah. Part, I, I, I want to say that part of raging against this like blanket term of fusion Mm -hmm. 
is celebrating the Taos um, of the world, <laughs> edamame dumplings, and like the, the the tuna salad with the black and white sesame seeds on the on the outside of the ahi tuna, and the lemongrass on the cod, um, but also celebrating like the Panera Pan Asian honey sesame dressing. It's like you know, like it's also like, there's something so honestly bizarre to me because I didn't grow up in this country. Um, but understanding that also helped me understand like why we might have made missteps um, or how we had ended up with these dishes in the first place. Um, with fried rice, it's always, it's also always a wonderful story of, of how, you know, different uh, flavors come together in different uh, uh, cultures and different like cooking styles come together. Um, because at the end of the day, um, a lot of the way foodways works is when people move from country to country or from area to area, region to region, they bring with them their ideas and their ideas of how to cook and their techniques, but they fail to, they aren't able to bring their ingredients. Um, and in so doing, there's a necessary fusion and there's a necessary bastardization of authenticity that happens. And if you understand that to be like, that's just the way, you know, food develops, then I think we probably open our eyes up to a lot more compassion. I think so. And just towards the kind of specificity that there's so many different regions within China. There's so much mixing that has taken place over centuries um, in terms of cuisine, gastronomy, and that we have to respect that it's all different and coming together over time. Are there um, last oh, yeah. question before we go? Yeah, we should actually like taste some of the food. And I poured a little Havana Club. Um, um, to kind of honor and think about this um, coming together of these different flavors, the Caribbean, China, New York. Um, and yeah, to understand the history is really important. Cheers. Um, so if you want to find out more, the easiest way to get in touch with us, obviously, is through Instagram. Um, Tao is at, at gastropoetics underscore of underscore Tao. I'm at lucas.sin. We'd love to continue this conversation. Um, and also, just thank you so much for supporting MoFad. Thank you so much for supporting the green space. Watch everything they do because it's always been outstanding. Um, thank you, everybody, for cooking with us tonight. Can, let's continue the conversation. I hope this worked out for you. <laughs> yeah, and take pictures. Show us. Um, we would love to see it on the other side. Yeah, and if it didn't work, this does let me have it. It's all, I'll put it on my back. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Good night. <laughs>